Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture in Geography 340, Climatology. Uh, this week's lecture topic is going to focus on ocean circulation and currents. I apologize uh, for it to you all. I'm pretty low energy today. Uh, I just had my little one born this past Friday, so pretty mellow, very quiet, very uh, sleep deprived at this point. Uh, so bear with me. If you feel like you must put the video in one and a half time speed or one and a quarter time speed. So I, I maintain my normal pep. So <laughs> with that, let's go ahead and get started on ocean circulation and currents. First off, big shout out to Dr. Ian Walker. Uh, Dr. Walker was my PhD advisor, uh, brilliant scientist and has provided the lecture for this week. Uh, he teaches a class on oceanography and physical geography, and this was his oceanography, uh, or pardon me, his, his uh, currents and gyres lecture. So uh, acknowledgments and big shout out to Dr. Walker for providing this for us today. So we're going to be talking about the ocean currents and circulations, things we call gyres, basically how water moves across the planet in our oceans this thing that we call the ocean conveyor belt, which is kind of this combination of warm, shallow currents and cold and salty deep ocean currents. And we can see in that image on the top or on the right side there, just kind of examples of what some of these circulating ocean current systems look like. We're looking here at the current coming up the, or the, what we would call the Gulf Stream current coming up the Gulf and uh, East Coast of the United States going off through Canada. So, what are our learning objectives today? We're going to be talking about what are ocean currents and what causes them? How do surface winds create ocean currents? What is the Ekman layer and how does it relate to surface ocean circulation? What is a geostrophic gyre? How do they re relate to atmospheric circulation? How do gyres influence local climates and regional climates? What is the Gulf Stream and what is the California current? What is upwelling and downwelling? And what is a marine layer? So these are topics we're gonna to be kind of covering. Uh, so our objectives kind of extend for this week. How does uh, water circulate from surface currents to deep ocean currents? What factors control ocean water circulation? So things like winds, temperature, salinity, and pressure. This is really building off of these last number of weeks of lecturing where we've talked about these big, global patterns of uh, atmospheric circulation going from surface temperatures and global temperature, uh, temper sorry, temperatures to looking at um, more of the variations in wind and pressure across our planet. So then we're going to talk about thermohaline or thermohaline stratification and how does it relate to seawater circulation. We're going to talk about what is the global ocean conveyor belt and what drives it. Uh, and what is the North Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, AMOC, and why is it important? And then finally, why is there concern about melting ice sheets, such as those in Greenland, and global ocean circulation? So first off, what are ocean currents? Well, they are continuous, predictable, directional movements of water within the ocean. We think of this global ocean conveyor belt. They can move both horizontally and vertically. So horizontal uh, would be things like surface currents and deep ocean currents. Vertical would relate to things like upwelling and downwelling. We'll get to those in the later portions of the video here. So these are driven by a number of different things. We talked about things like the Coriolis effect and its impact on surface winds. Well, these ocean currents are driven by gravity, wind shear, and water density, so temperature and salinity. So let's start off talking about wind-driven currents. So recall that when wind blows, it exerts some type of force on the surface, right? We talked about that a little bit in these last videos, and we talked about how uh, wind blowing over really rough surfaces, like those with trees and buildings, that time it takes for the wind to reach free stream is displaced vertically. 
Uh, we talked about that before, but the same thing happens when you have water blowing over an ocean or a large body of water, very large body of water. It exerts this shearing force on the ocean. So what we're concerned about most is how it produces wind-driven surface currents. So current energy uh, or the speed of currents is about 3% that of the wind speed. Now it varies from place to place, but the fastest ocean currents are up to two to three meters per second or six to 10 kilometers per hour. Uh, and that would be seen in the Gulf Stream on the East Coast of the United States and Canada, uh, which we can see there. You see those, uh, the darker in red and purple, the faster that current is. And we can see here, that's the uh, Gulf Stream current that we're looking at right there in that bottom right image. So how uh, do wind currents develop? Well, wind blows over the ocean surface. If we think of those gi those global circulation patterns, right? Uh, looking at kind of the Hadley cells, the feral cell, the polar cell, these areas of high and low pressure where air is converging and diverging at the surface, or it's cycling, uh, how the Coriolis dry or, uh, force drives wind. These all impact the surface and currents on the surface. So surface shear force causes surface water to move in the direction of the wind. Frictional drag causes deeper layers to be dragged along as well. So if you think of, you know, kind of, you know, if this is your, your ocean here, like layers of water and wind is blowing this way, right? This way. So, sorry doing this reverse. The wind is blowing this way. Well, it's going to get dragged here, and this is going to get dragged with it at a slower rate, if that makes sense. So it'll kind of look like this. So if wind is moving across, this will kind of lag behind the faster currents on the surface versus the slower currents underneath. Then the influence of wind shear and strength of currents decreases with depth. What does that look like? Well, it looks like this. So here we see uh, wind shear force in the bottom right image. The top uh, is the most turbulent, right? It's the most impacted by the variations in wind on the surface. As you go deeper, it's dragged along with it, but it's less tur tur turbulent. And it de that turbulence decreases with depth in the ocean column or the water column. So energy is transmitted downward by these turbulent motions. It's diffused through the system down into the ocean by this turbulent motion here. Kind of think of it like gears that move water along from the power of the wind. So stronger, longer winds equals greater turbulence. It also equals faster and deeper surface currents. So Look at here, uh, more on surface winds and ocean currents. So Norwegian explorer, uh, Fritjof Nansen, definitely didn't say that right, intentionally grounded his ship so he could flow with the ice across the Arctic Ocean to the North Pole. So quick question, if we think to all of the things we've been talking about, his observations showed that the ship in ice always drifted 20 to, about 20 degrees to 40 degrees to the right of the wind direction. Why? What do we think that is? Is it because the density of ice is less than ocean water? So ice floats and ice moves differently than water with wind shear? Is it because of B, faster rates of rotation closer to the poles or greater deflection? Because of C, because centrifugal forces uh, act in the opposite direction of wind shear? Or is it because of D, Coriolis force acts on water progressively beneath the surface of the ocean, causing deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere. Well, consider wind blowing to the north in the northern hemisphere. Surface layers of water start to move northward with the wind. So in our diagram there, if wind is blowing straight north, uh, friction is, or sorry, the Coriolis effect is working at a, roughly a right angle to that wind. Um, friction is working opposite of the direction of the 
cumulative vector for surface currents. So at the surface, that friction force opposes some of the motion, and that's what causes our turbulent energy exchange into the deeper layers of the water column. Beneath the surface, the Coriolis force acts to deflect the motion to the right, similar to what we see with wind flow in the atmosphere. And then surface currents move to about 45 degrees uh, to the right of wind stress in the northern hemisphere, uh, or 45 degrees to the left in the southern hemisphere. We look here, here's our Coriolis diagram as well, kind of how these different uh, speeds of rotation impact and can impact the direction and magnitude of the imparted force of the Coriolis effect on winds and ocean currents. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is the Ekman spiral. And you can click on that link below uh, in the PDF to look at a graphic uh, to kind of show this here. So this is building on uh, Nansen's observations. Walfred Ekman solved equations for wind generated surface currents. Turbulent exchanges between layers uh, plus the Coriolis deflection in the upper ocean caused entire water spot, water columns to be set in motion. This is what we call the Ekman spiral. And you can see the Ekman spiral here. You can see wind stress is going uh, to kind of the back right of the image there. Uh, and we can see current speed and deflection is based off of that, the magnitude or length of that vector, that, that arrow. Uh, and then the mean flow direction we can see by the arrow. So even though wind stress is going kind of uh, at almost a right angle to the mean direction of flow, as we have the import or imparted forces between turbulent exchanges and the Coriolis force deflecting water, we see that water kind of turning and a more general direction being kind of realized here. So net water transport in this wind-driven Ekman layer is 90 degrees to the right of the wind in the northern hemisphere, left in the southern hemisphere. So Ekman transport is an important mixing and energy exchange process in the surface ocean. Now let's take it from Ekman transport all the way to global circulation. So water accumulates in between wind circulation up to about two meters high. Uh, with very small slope from higher to lower elevation. We can see here in this example of kind of a global, we'll say gyre or global circulation pattern, where we've got uh, geostrophic flow V uh, existing around a gyre with F sub C, the inward deflection of force due to the Coriolis effect being balanced by F sub nine, or sub G, pardon me, the outward force act, or the outward acting pressure force created by the elevated water and gravity. So what we have is this creation of a pressure gradient, that F sub G, that moves water away from the center of these cells. Coriolis effect, F sub C, pushes in towards the center opposite that of the pressure gradient force. If the two forces are equal, F G equals F C, and opposite, we have geostrophic balance. We think back to our geostrophic winds that we've talked about in previous lectures. Flow, or V, around the center of the water uh, accumulation lens equals a geostrophic gyre. So now moving into geostrophic gyres. So gyres are rotational flow of surface waters linked to atmospheric circulation. Surface winds, these big general patterns, right? Large gyres at 20 to 30 degrees north or south latitude are associated with these subtropical high pressure anticyclones like we, we talked about in these past videos. So they rotate clockwise in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. We can kind of see an example of what those look like on that right graphic there. Smaller gyres in the North Pacific and North Atlantic near 50 degrees north latitude and south latitude that rotate uh, counterclockwise with large polar low, uh, um, sorry, low pressure cyclones or these big low pressure systems here. There are other smaller gyres also. So here we can see kind of some of these dominant gyres, right? We see warm and cold water currents. 
see the North Pacific right there, the North Atlantic and South Pacific, and the South Atlantic. Then we see the Indian Ocean. These are some of the big gyres. So how did we kind of learn about some of these? And through, you know, shipping and transit across the oceans was a big way, but another interesting way was the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, uh, which is, I'll provide uh, another video uh, link in the descriptions and uh, canvas page, kind of set some of this up, but go ahead and look at that Plastic Adrift website. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, we see basically how garbage that has flown or been deposited into the ocean in one way or another accumulates based on the location of these gyres. So in the Pacific, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, it says this plastic dumped into the ocean will uh, follow ocean currents, eventually ending up along another coast or accumulating in the open ocean. One of the ways we learned about some of this stuff was actually uh, a gigantic, uh, I guess you could call it pollution of rubber duckies. I wish, I wish that was, we could make that up. Uh, but rubber duckies that were being transported by via ship fell overboard and there are rubber duckies that have been tracked all over the world based off of these, these gyres. And that's, I'll post a link that talks about that a little bit uh, in the video description, but fascinating stuff. Here we can see the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. 46% of the total mass is made up of discarded fishing gear. Now that is pretty concerning. Because fishing is such an important part of our economic livelihood in some of these coastal areas, but it's also a big way to, that we eat. I mean, we like sushi, we like fish, you know, Atlantic cod, halibut, all these different fish that we've grown to love. There's a big pollution issue that stems from that. So in the Atlantic, Atlantic subtropical gyre circulation, we want to look at, you know, how do gyres influence regional climates? This is a climate uh, class. So we are interested in climates in general. Warmer eastern shores, so the southeast coast of the U.S., due to warm currents, uh, are driven by the Gulf Stream. So these are warmer regions that are driven by the circulation of ocean water. On western shores, for example, the northwest Africa, uh, are cooler due to the Canary climate or the Canary uh, gyre or current. So that's a cooler current. Now it's not always going to be east or west, but uh, what drives that is kind of these dominant trends in warmer or colder ocean currents. So you can have a, a vastly different climate than what you would expect if you were in a continental location along the coast, because not only the moderating effect of water, the higher specific heat, so it takes longer to warm up and cool down, but you can have kind of this injection of warmer or colder ocean currents that completely change uh, a climate in a given area. This can also promote upwelling of cold waters from the deeper ocean. When we look at the Gulf Stream again, we can see uh, the orange red is warm. We see these what we call core eddies, warm core eddies. So these kind of circulating eddy systems where uh, they're driven by warm or cold water and differences in warm and cold water. So this is a Western boundary current. So the West side of the gyre, one of the fastest in the world moves at speeds of two to three meters per second over seven kilometers per hour, moves like a river of warm water flowing uh, Northeast along the Eastern coast. And it creates these eddies with warm or cold cores. So we can see basically along the entire portion of the Eastern United States from Florida, all the way up through uh, the Carolinas and into not all the way up north, but um, plenty along the East Coast, is this kind of injection of warm water that drives warmer climates. So we think of energy or heat transfers in the ocean and atmosphere. Uh, 
as a percent of heat energy transported poleward by the oceans and atmosphere by latitude. Uh, at latitudes greater than 60%, 9.2% of that energy transfer is driven by ocean currents. 90.8 uh, is driven by atmosphere, uh, the atmospheric stuff. But if we get down to this, the equatorial regions, uh, that is dominated by the transfer of ocean currents, of energy via ocean currents. So 59% of the heat energy transfer in the oceans uh, and atmospheres is driven by the oceans near the poles, 41% near the, uh, driven by the atmosphere and atmospheric circulation. Thus, we have this coupled system, right? We're looking at the world as a system. It's not different pieces and parts. Oceans store heat, the atmosphere moves it. So, Water, because it has a higher specific heat, kind of absorbs much of that that energy. And then the atmosphere drives these global patterns through things like the Coriolis force, through wind shear, uh, through just general atmospheric circulation patterns. So ocean circulation strongly depends on surface winds and density. It's the next big thing we're gonna really talk about. So temperature and salinity gradients. So here, uh, we're going to talk about convection and heat flux in oceans. So the atmosphere is heated from below by heat flux from warming land or ocean surfaces. We've kind of talked about some of this in uh, looking at energy, global energy budgets. So warm air rises, right? It's less dense. Cold air sinks. It's more dense. We call this convection. In contrast, oceans are heated from above by solar radiation at the ocean surface. Warm water doesn't sink. Cold water doesn't rise. So you have a stability condition. There is no convection. You have kind of what we call stratification of these uh, different layers. So thus temperature in the ocean decreases with depth. What we call thermocline. So that thermocline is that steep gradient. If you look at that image to the bottom right, that graphic there, we can see uh, basically simplified profile of temperature with depth in the ocean, where at the top, that mixed layer, it stays pretty warm around 23 or so degrees Celsius. Uh, once you get 100 or 200 or so meters, you hit a thermocline where you have a rapid decrease in temperature from roughly 23 degrees Celsius, all the way down to about two to three degrees Celsius. And it stays pretty cold uh, from about 1,000 to 4,000 or one to four kilometers uh, and deeper into the ocean surface. There are latitudinal variations in that. Here we can see uh, a number of different thermoclines, right? Uh, so there are seasonal and permanent thermoclines uh, in the Mid latitudes, so kind of you know 45 or so around where we live, uh, if you were in a coastal position, you see this big change between seasonal and permanent thermoclines. So sometimes it's much much warmer; it gets all the way up to about 20 degrees Celsius. But other times, that top level of the ocean is only about 10 degrees Celsius, and that drop off is much less gradual uh, than if you were to have a seasonal or uh, or during the seasonal times, pardon me. If you move to the low latitudes, these equatorial regions, right? It's much, much more uh, gradual and abrupt thermocline, I guess. Uh, if you look at it here around 23 to 24 degrees Celsius, uh, it levels off uh, just about 400 meters or so below the surface of the ocean. Uh, and then it's a pretty steep decline all the way down in the subsur or into the deeper portions of our ocean. Uh, now, in the high latitudes, poleward, that's a bit more interesting. So we're here where climate tends to be uniformly cold, you can actually see kind of a, a vast decrease in uh, temperature from just above zero to a little below zero, although it stays pretty consistent, uh, but then it increases again. You kind of have this inversion point uh, as you're going below. And then it just kind of stays 
really cold, <laughs> I think is the best way to put it. So there's also variation in density with depth. So recall that changes in temperature, salinity, and pressure control the density of water. As density increases, or density increases as temperature drops, density increases as salinity increases, and density increases as pressure increases. All result in an increase in mass within a volume of water. So generally, temperatures and salinity are the most important controls on density. This results in density layers or thermohaline stratification. So what does that look like? Well, here we can see the Atlantic North-South thermohaline circulation, uh, right kind of in that boxed area there. So here what we've got is uh, kind of Mediterranean outflow water, so kind of warmer and uh, a bit more saline water uh, coming out of the Mediterranean area. The Antarctic, kind of this intermediate water, uh, it has decent density uh, and it's much colder. Then we see our, you know, the densest stuff. So the densest and coldest sinks. That's what we get. That's where we get our uh, Antarctic bottom water. And we also have our North Atlantic deep water. These are driven by colder and more saline or uh, saltier waters, whereas the stuff on the surface is going to be warmer and a little bit less salty. So here you can see the distribution of seawater temperatures uh, here. A lot of it is that really deep storage water. So the really, really, really deep stuff. Um, that would be, you know, less than two degrees Celsius uh, is where we see the majority of that water. And it's a little bit less. We have fewer warm, shallow waters than we do cold, denser waters. So here we can see just kind of that similar to the graphic that we saw before. It might take thousands to, or hundreds of thousands of years for a molecule of water to complete this full trend from this shallow current, warm and less salty to these deep currents. And here we can see some of those currents here. Uh, we've seen this graph before, so I'll continue on. And here's just another graphic to kind of show that same thing as we saw before, kind of this stratification in the Atlantic. So density and density of seawater uh, is kind of driven by convection. So this vertical, vertical exchange between the surface and deep ocean will only happen when surface water density exceeds or equals deeper waters, right? Then surface water will sink. So how can surface waters increase in density? They can cool. So colder water is denser water. They can become more salty or both can happen. So only a few locations globally uh, exist where surface ocean water becomes cold and or salty enough to sink into the deep ocean. We call these deep water formation zones. Where this occurs, surface water is overturned, or kind of turns over and sinks. Somewhere else, deep ocean water must return to the surface. Recall this law of conservation of mass, right? We've talked about it in previous lectures. Circulation is like a giant conveyor belt. If you think of a conveyor belt that kind of moves along, it, at some point it's got to flip and the bottom part has to reverse, right? It kind of goes in this big cycle like this. So at some point you need to have that overturning point. So you'll have a downwelling and upwelling of water somewhere. There are two main places where this occurs. The North Atlantic near uh, the Northeast coast of Canada and Greenland and the Southern Ocean near Antarctica. Because these locations fuel the ocean's global conveyor belts, they are incredibly important as drivers for our Earth climate. Here we can see uh, another example of a thermohaline conveyor belt uh, with salinity uh, kind of shown by that blue to tannish gradational scale. 
So we see deep water formation in uh, the North Atlantic. We see it in the South Ocean as well. We see surface currents going along the North Coast of South America and the Gulf Coast. We see deeper currents going through much of the Pacific. So if we look again at this North Atlantic, pardon me, uh, thermal hyaline circulation. So wind driven surface currents such as the Gulf Stream rapidly bring warm water northward. As these waters cool and evaporate, this water becomes colder and saltier, denser, and it sinks. Much of the water returns southward in the gyre circulation through the Canary Current. Some of it continues north to the very cold Greenland and Norwegian seas. Here it becomes so dense and sinks to the bottom, forming a very slow southward flowing bottom current. It's kind of what it looks like today. So the Gulf Stream and climate, why is Boston's climate, 42 North, generally cooler than London, England? Is it because it's further north? It's influenced by a cool Greenland current? It's influenced by a warm Gulf Stream current? Or it's further south? So go ahead and think about that for a second. Pause the video. I'm going to give the answer now. The answer is B. It's influenced by a cool Greenland current. So... One of the big things I think facing us today and that we'll be talking about uh, and learning a bit more about in some of the, this, the other videos I'm posting is this new evidence that indicates that the Gulf Stream Circulation System, the North Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC for short, is slowing down. So ocean temperatures in the North Atlantic are cooling down contrary to what is happening in the rest of the world's oceans, which are warming. This is not good <laughs> um, because the water exchange uh, between cold, warm and cold water in the AMOC region feeds that global ocean circulation through deep ocean currents. If it slows down, that conveyor belt kind of shuts off. We don't know what's going to happen when that conveyor belt kind of stops functioning in its current capacity. We're already dealing with widespread changes in our global climate through anthropogenic global warming and climate change. But when we see this, this is a magnitude of circulation that we have never seen before. Um, and how it will change is terrifying. When we think of these currents, they bring things like nutrients, species, etc., around the world. They moderate our temperatures, they change our climates. But if those aren't functioning, then it's hard to say what's going to happen to these global cycles because we're shutting them off um, through anthropogenic global warming. Kind of a freshwater injection into this AMOC region is kind of starting to throw off that cycle. If we look at that big blurb of blue in the map on the bottom right, that's what we're talking about. We're, we're seeing a major influx of fresh cold water from the Greenland ice sheet. As that Greenland ice sheet is melting, it's dumping into the North Atlantic. As it does so, it's changing these global circulation patterns. And we're actually seeing this conveyor belt already slowing down. So typically, continual formation of deep waters in the North Atlantic pulls warmer waters northward, vastly in influencing Earth's climate. As we said, these regions of deep water formation in the North Atlantic are next to a giant ice sheet, Greenland. So what do you think will happen when density of surface waters and the formation rates of deep waters, if this ice sheet melts? Well, density will decrease due to increased freshwater inputs, making that water less dense, making it harder to form that deep water. Scientists concerned that the AMOC might be slowing down because of this effect. Region is now heavily instrumented with sensors to track the strength and surface and deep ocean currents, and we are seeing changes. So moving on next to talk about uh, coastal upwelling. So this upward movement uh, of cold nutrient rich water along coasts. This is caused by longshore currents and offshore Ekman transport. We can see in that graphic there. 
So what this results in is biologically productive water. You're bringing nutrients up uh, based off of these differences into areas that can use them from these deep water areas. Downwelling can also occur when the Ekman transport is oriented towards the shore, northbound on, for example, the west coast. We can see here in this graphic down below. So it's common on western coasts of some continents to see kind of this upwelling. So surface uh, wind rotation around subtropical high pressure systems, boundary currents with offshore oriented Ekman transport, and what this does is it moderates or cools and dries local climates. Think of these as some of our large deserts, right? The Sahara, the uh, Southwest, the Atacama, all these major deserts, they're kind of around these areas. The upwelling on the central coast of California brings cold nutrient rich waters that are rich in this phytoplankton or algae with high concentrations of chlorophyll. We can kind of see Monterey Bay there uh, to the north of that, kind of the San Francisco Bay area, looking at kind of where this upwelling is. And this feeds tons of, we think of kind of the, the food web, right? Smaller organisms are eaten by larger and larger and larger organisms. Well, this upwelling can bring this nutrient-rich water here. Now, that's sometimes problematic because this nutrient-rich water, when heated, can lead to things like eutrophication and hypoxic zones. Um, which is another global issue that we have to deal with. So I'm going to skip this one. So then uh, we think of the, the marine layer. You might have heard this before. Uh, so cold water from the upwelling currents promotes the formation of a marine layer or a low-lying coastal fog or cloud cover layer. This is caused by a temperature inversion in the air over the ocean. Cold marine air below warm descending dry air from the mountains. So you've got this warm descending dry air coming in and this cold moist air from the oceans. And you have kind of this temperature inversion uh, that is that helps to form this marine layer. So as moisture condenses in the air, uh, the cool marine layer forms uh, and we see these fogs and low clouds. You might think of, you can see it in this image here, the marine layer over Santa Barbara. Uh, but you can also think of Carl. There's a fun tip for you. Carl is the name given to the fog, the marine layer that rolls in and out of the San Francisco Bay area. So in summary, ocean currents are persistent. Directional flows of water in the ocean caused by winds gravity and density differences, they can move horizontally and vertically. Wind drive driven surface currents results from shear exerted on the ocean that moves water. Some energy and motion transferred into the water column, uh, which experiences Coriolis deflection, leads to Ekman transport. The zone of interaction equals the Ekman layer, an important mixing and energy transfer process. Geostrophic gyres result from rotation of winds around ocean basins, subtropical high pressure atmosphere, uh, sorry, high pressure cells in the atmosphere and Ekman transport towards the center. This creates a pressure gradient and a change in elevation. Uh, plus, Coriolis force can generate geostrophic winds and flow around the gyre. Gyres can moderate local climates by warming or cooling them, depending on the type of current. Upwelling is the upward movement of cold, nutrient-rich water from the deep ocean offshore, driven by onshore Ekman transport. Downwelling is the opposite. And the marine layer results from warm air on land flowing over cold marine air. So think of Santa Barbara or San Francisco. And we can say here in our summary, ocean current or ocean water circulates both as surface currents and deep ocean currents. Surface currents are controlled by wind shear in the Ekman spiral. Uh, and by temperature and or salinity differences in the ocean that create this thermohaline stratification, these density gradients that cause water to move, warm, fresher water to rise, cold, uh, denser water, saltier water to sink. The ocean conveyor belt is an overturning circulation that links surface currents to deep ocean currents. It's driven by two major areas of deep, cold water formation, the North Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Southern Oceans near the Antarctic. 
And the AMOC is a critical area of deep water formation fueling this conveyor belt circulation and the major control on Earth's climate. Our concern with the AMOC is that increased freshwater melt from Greenland could disrupt global ocean circulation and climates. So with that, we're going to end the video here. Uh, I will have another video posted for you to watch, another great video on ocean currents and how they're changing, particularly focusing on the AMOC. So go ahead and watch that video, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.